All right, the next few moments will be devoted to what we've been uh, talking about. First John 1 John 1.9. Now, I don't know how many of you had a chance to sin in the last 15 minutes, but it's possible. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful opportunity this morning to continue in studying your word. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to what we are about to note. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now we were talking about 1 John 1, 9. To simply name your sins and that results in forgiveness of those sins. So what then after you name your sins? Uh, there's a procedure to continue to follow. So turn in your Bibles to Philippians 3.13. Philippians 3.13. Now, God doesn't leave us hanging by saying, name your sins, and then you wonder, well, what do I do next? What do I do next? Well, God gives us an answer in Philippians 3.13. And this is the Apostle Paul writing. And he says, royal family members, and of course all of us who have believed in Christ, are actual royalty. We might not act like it, but all of us uh, are royalty. For example, uh, one time on a job application, I really didn't uh, care about the job, but I was, uh, I don't even know why I applied, but I did. And uh, on that it said, what race? And I wrote, royal family of God. So they didn't call me back for some reason. <laughs> they probably thought I was a freak. So it says, uh, royal family members. I do not, it's a, uh, Philippians 3.13. Royal family members, I do not evaluate myself to have obtained the objective. What is the objective? That is pleroma to theu in the Greek. That's the fullness of blessing uh, from God. Now that means that uh, you have an objective to grow in grace and in knowledge so that eventually you will reach this. Now Paul is... Uh, he's in spiritual self-esteem. You don't know these terms yet, but he's at a personal sense of destiny, which means he has the mirror of the Word of God to look into, and he knows where he is, and he can say, I have not yet attained. So he knows he hasn't. And But he continues to say, but one thing I concentrate on. Now, concentration is very important. If you want to grow up, and uh, grow up in the spiritual life. And in fact, if you want to uh, grow up just in terms of mentally, concentration is very important. Uh, when you go to college or something, uh, you can't not listen to the prof professor and learn the subject. And you might try to read from the book or whatever, but you're going to fall behind because you have to have concentration. And one of the things God the Holy Spirit uh, does for us in terms of uh, spiritual matters, He gives us a, a greater ability to concentrate on those things. And therefore, uh, when I'm being monotone and everybody wants to go to sleep, God the Holy Spirit, in spite of uh, my boringness, will uh, turn that concentration switch on and you can listen to it. Now, one way to uh, a pastor can... Uh, make somebody concentrate is to tell them concentrate so see there's some uh, voice inflection that uh, the pastor can use I don't like to scream especially not today I'm not I'm in no mood to scream but uh, if I have to to grab some uh, attention I might just have to uh, turn it up a little bit so but uh, one thing I concentrate on on the one hand disregarding what lies behind what lies behind that's those sins you've committed what do you do now your Bible says forgetting well the fact is uh, we commit sins and we'll, we, a lot of times we might forget what we've done but Unless you're, you have Alzheimer's, you're not going to forget what you've done a week ago. You're going to remember that you committed a stupid sin a week ago. Now, forgetting it, well, that's impossible, really. You can't uh, wipe it out of your brain. Actually, this means to disregard it, like throw it in the trash. You know, here's my sin. I name it, just toss it in the trash. It's over. Now, you'll remember it, but don't have any guilt reaction to it. This is what this is saying. Forget that guilt. Forget that stupid stuff of weeping about it and moping around. That's not uh, the Christian way of life. You must disregard what lies behind, and what lies behind is those stupid things you've done. And on the other hand, sprinting toward the finish line. Now, sprinting, this indicates you're running as fast as you can. In other words, you can't get enough of the Word of God. You want to stuff it in your soul day after day. And um, 
You go all day without uh, listening to doctrine. It's like going all day without eating to you. You need to eat, so uh, you need to feed your soul. So what you do is listen to doctrine. And therefore, you're sprinting toward the finish line. And uh, Paul was definitely sprinting. Uh, he was he was a madman when it came to doctrine. Boy, that was his life, and he was always sprinting. And yet, he had not attained, so you see how far we have to go. So, we must sprint toward the finish line, which means uh, to... And then 314, I keep advancing to the objective for the winner's prize of the upward call from God in Christ Jesus. Now, your Bible might have a a slightly different translation. That's because uh, it hasn't been uh, correctly translated from the Greek. It's uh, pretty close, except for the forgetting part. It's actually uh, disregarding, and then it says upward call of God. Well, that's the advancing to the objective of the winner's prize. And in fact... When you move to spiritual maturity, you actually uh, receive rewards. Now, the motivation to move to maturity is not because you say, I'm going to get this uh, reward. It's your motivation comes from your love for God. It's your love for God, and as a result of that, you uh, might get a prize, but your motivation is not uh, just to get a trophy or some sort, but as a result of moving to maturity, you do receive the prize. And in fact, in the millennium, you, if you uh, grow to spiritual maturity, uh, might end up being the king of uh, some country in the millennium. And of course, you'll be serving under Christ. And uh, the the millennium, if you don't know what that is, that's the thousand-year reign of Christ when he comes back after the tribulation. So, and we won't go through the tribulation. We will be resurrected in the ex anastasis. That means the ex resurrection. And uh, we don't know when that's going to occur, but when it does occur, all of us who have believed in Christ will immediately you know, disappear and go to heaven, just uh, meet up with him in the clouds. Therefore, when you name your sins to God, you must disregard them. And, of course, you might not forget about it, but you have disregarded it. And that means you can't let sin be a distraction to your spiritual life. And that's one of the greatest problems in churches today is that uh, people have a guilt reaction to all the things that they've been doing. And that's a distraction to them. They're They're not doing what Paul said and they're not even close to advancing in the spiritual life. Now, David, we're going to be studying David. That's a good case of a man who was uh, after God's own heart who had to utilize rebound as all of us do. And uh, David regretted, in fact, his sin of adultery and murder. But just because he regretted it, and it says so in the Bible that he regretted it, that's not what forgave him. And we will see in the Psalms exactly what David did. And he did the same thing we do. Uh, from 1 John 1 9, although he had he did not have 1 John 1 9, he understood these things from the sacrifices, uh, and that's what he learned from was the sacrifices. And uh, David knew a lot of doctrine. Uh, for somebody who didn't have the completed canon of Scripture, he went a long way. And uh, David regretted what he did. And what did David do? Well, he uh, committed adultery and murder. The man after God's own heart committed murder. <clears throat> so. Let's uh, get into this uh, study of David's tangled web of sin. In fact, he created a tangled web for himself by trying to hide sin. After Instead of naming it, he just uh, tried to hide them. And he kept trying to hide them, and, well, the web got bigger, and it caught up with him. You see, he put himself above the law. He thought that uh, he was king. He had enough power to get away with what he was doing, but he didn't, and he suffered greatly for what he had done. So turn to... Um, I believe it's 2 Samuel 11. 1. 2 Samuel 11. 1. Now, up until this point, David had uh, reached spiritual maturity. He was a mature believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, uh, in fact, one of the greatest believers of the Old Testament was David. So, uh, you have to keep in mind that the person you're looking at here, you won't recognize him. But you have to keep in mind that he is a mature believer. And you say, well, not even a believer would commit such sins. Yes, they do. A believer can commit a sin just like an unbeliever can. We have the old sin nature in us. So in the spring of the year, at the time when kings normally conduct wars, David sent out Joab with his soldiers and the entire Israelite army. We see here David had been humble for so long, but suddenly he decides to put himself above the law. You see, King David David should have been out conducting the war. That was his job. That was the protocol of the age. 
in the spring of the year. That was the time when David should have went out and conducted the war. But we see here his spiritual malfunction in that uh, suddenly he's king and he thinks he has the power to be above the law. So he says, I'm not going. I'll send Joab and my soldiers to do this. I don't want to mess with that right now as king. So as king, he had been entrusted with enormous power. In fact, uh, kings in those, they had absolute power. You said something wrong to the king, he could cut your head off just like that. And, uh, and he wouldn't, and the king wouldn't think twice about doing it either because they had been given such tremendous power. So David had been struck with arrogance and he stops following the procedure or the protocol. And uh, in the same way, if we stop following the procedure of 1 John 1 9, we are arrogant and we will live out our days in carnality, that is, under the power of the sin nature, instead of under the power of God the Holy Spirit. So David puts himself above the law. And many people who attain great fame or great power uh, have this problem. We've had presidents who had a, uh, this problem, and without naming names, a lot of presidents actually have had this problem of putting themselves above the law, uh, committing perjury and such things, uh, you know who it is by now, without uh, thinking they can get away with it. So nonetheless, the overruling uh, will of God kicks in. That means uh, David's trying to get away with something. Well... God's not going to let him, so the overruling will of God will kick in. So we continue uh, from 11.1. They defeated the Ammonites and laid Rabbah under, under siege. And then we see, but David stayed in Jerusalem. David shouldn't have stayed in Jerusalem. He should have went out and defeated them. And he would have been the one that got all the glory for defeating them. And, of course, David was one to always give uh, glory to God. So this would have been a victory uh, for David if he had went. But instead, he, he didn't want to go. So he, But and God, in his grace, allowed Israel to defeat uh, the enemy anyway. So David didn't go, um, but uh, Israel still won the battle. And then we see in 11.2, On a certain evening, David got up from his couch. See, he was being a couch potato when he should have been fighting a war. On a certain evening, David got up from his couch and walked around on the roof of his palace. What does this indicate? He's bored. David is bored. Now, all of us have suffered from boredom at some point, uh, but the more you grow up spiritually, the less likely it is you'll be bored. You'll say... Uh, I'm so bored. You want something to do. If you have the thinking of Christ, it is nearly impossible to get bored. Now, um, I said something about this in the earlier tapes. Well, they're not earlier. They're actually 7 through 10, and you can get that on tape, uh, talking about boredom. So David was suffering from boredom, and that indicates a, a kink in his spiritual life. That means he's lost his capacity for life. If you have capacity for life, love and happiness, uh, boredom is very rare in your case. You're not going to be bored. And a lot of times what people do when they get bored is they turn to uh, drugs or excessive alcohol or other things to solve their problem of boredom, and uh, therefore they start destroying neurons. That's not the way to go. The way to go is to uh, put the doctrine in your soul, and when you have the thinking of Christ, it is impossible to be bored. So from the roof in his boredom, he sees a woman bathing. Now this woman was a very attractive, a very uh, beautiful woman, and for this woman to catch David's eye means that she was beautiful because he had about uh, nine or ten women already in his harem that he could have uh, chose from, and therefore um, this woman was beautiful and it caught David's eye. So uh, David's looking out and he says, I'm bored, and he sees a naked woman and he says, I can solve this boredom. And that's what he's thinking. But, uh, yeah, he solved his boredom all right. We'll see what happens. 11.3. So David sent someone to inquire about the woman. And the messenger said, Isn't that Bathsheba, the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? In other words, uh, the messenger's saying, David, this woman's married. What are you thinking? But David sent the messengers anyway. He said, Go get her. He doesn't care. He's above the law. So, oh, I'm not uh, bound by the laws of marriage. I'll take this beautiful woman. I'm king. I can do what I want. I'm bored anyway. Get me that woman. So David sent messengers and took her. And when she came to him, he had sexual relations with her. And then uh, she returned to her home. So uh, David saw this woman and said, uh, I'm going to have sex with her. Go get her. I'm the king. I want to have sex with her. So they ended up having sex. <clears throat> 
And then in 11.5, you see this is, uh, suddenly it comes back to roost for David. The woman conceived. This was the last thing David wanted to happen. In other words, uh, she's pregnant. And uh, she sent word to David saying, I am pregnant. Now here we see uh, something that we'll study in more detail in the basic series. That's the law of volitional responsibility. Uh, David thinks he could get away with everything, but the choices he made uh, have an automatic kickback in terms of uh, volitional responsibility. That means uh, you make a bad choice. For example, if you uh, steal something from a store and the police come and get you, well, that's volitional responsibility. You stole something, and now you're sitting in jail. The law of volitional responsibility. Now, David thinks he's above this, too. So he thinks he's above the law, and when she says that uh, she's pregnant, immediately he starts to come up with human solutions to the problem. He's thinking, well, I'm going to get away with this. Nobody can know what I've done. I'm the king. Nobody should know. And therefore, uh, I'm going to... Uh, cover this up so uh, for you young people to have sex outside of marriage or uh, you want to have a sexual experience or or do something like that what you're doing is putting yourself above the law and there is misery now you think it's fun and you might have to get a kick out of it but there's misery when it comes to this because uh, uh, it comes out of wedlock births you can have out of wedlock birth the breakdown of marriage and in fact the breakdown of society and the destruction of a nation so you think it's fun uh, to go out and, and fornicate but uh, in, in fact what you're doing is uh, you're destroying your marriage before it even gets started lots of marriages have been destroyed in the back seats of cars before uh, you're even married and that's because uh, the the soul there's a lot of things involved with the soul there's a lot of things involved with the sex uh, you start to uh, make a composite uh, for example if you're a, a man who's had sex with lots of women you start to make a composite of a woman and uh, therefore the the reaction to you is all the same yet each woman has a different reaction or a different response to sex and therefore you think you're a great sex machine but you're not you're, you're destroying that in your soul by making a, a composite and in the same way uh, women do the same thing so David sent word to Joab saying send me Uriah the Hittite so Joab sent Uriah to David when Uriah came to him David asked about how things were with Joab and how the army was doing and how the battle was going David didn't care David's putting on a front he don't care how it's going in fact uh, all those people over there all his soldiers could have been slaughtered and uh, all he's thinking about is getting out of what he's done so David is moving through the cogwheels we've studied that uh, self justification self deception and self absorption David's in self absorption he doesn't care about the battle he doesn't care about Israel he doesn't care about Joab and he doesn't care about Uriah he's completely self absorbed in himself and determined to circumvent the law of volitional responsibility so instead of taking responsibility for his adultery through naming his sins to God and say, in, in other words own up to it buddy you you just uh, committed adultery own up to it and if he had said if he had owned up to it before uh, now and uh, try his punishment wouldn't have been nearly as great as it's going to be so instead of taking responsibility for his adultery by saying father I committed adultery instead he's trying to put himself above the law and above God himself he's actually having a revolution in his soul against God and you know what God does as part of that punishment he sends up his own son Absalom to have a revolution against him and this was the indication of David you had a revolution against me let me show you what that's like so Absalom has a revolution against um, David as part of his punishment so you don't get away with anything now you say first John 1 9 is a license to sin no you don't get away with it this woman's pregnant it's not uh, her husband's child it's somebody else's child there's all kind of problems emotional problems all types of things that are going on right here and that's already part of David's punishment in the law of volitional responsibility God has not yet laid the hammer down on David this is just the law of volitional responsibility catching up with him and he's all tore up about that so just wait till God gets a hold of him 
So then David said to Uriah in 11.8, Go down to your home and wash your feet. This is another front. He wants him to go home and have sex with his wife so that uh, he'll think that the one who is conceived in her is of Uriah and not of David. But it is of David. So he tells, he thinks he's getting out of this. Uriah, go go home, wash your feet, relax. In other words, go home. Uh, be comforted by your wife. And uh, and therefore everybody, in other words, he's thinking everybody will think this is your child and not mine. So Uriah went out from the palace and he went, he went with a gift from the king. Now if I was Uriah, I'd be wondering, why is the king being so nice to me? Maybe he thought that, it doesn't say. So Uriah went out from the palace with a gift from the king soon to reach him but Uriah look what Uriah does he lay at the door of the palace with all the servants of his lord now this indicates uh, Uriah has great respect for authority great respect for his king great respect for the protocol of the land and uh, we see here where he says he did not go to his home and why not he didn't go because uh, given the chance after being on the battlefield and uh, in that, out in the elements, in the rain, the cold, whatever, uh, in the dry desert heat, he, he could have went home to comfort, but he didn't do it. And why didn't he do it? Because Uriah is actually a man of integrity. I don't know his spiritual status. I don't even know if he was a believer, but we do know he had integrity when it came to his nationalism. He loved his country. He loved his king. He respected authority, and he calls even David his lord, and he, David is his lord as his king. And so... Uh, what happens here, uh, he doesn't uh, go to the house. So then David, in 1110, so they informed David, saying, they got some spies looking at Uriah, they informed David, saying, Uriah has not gone down to his house. So David said to Uriah, haven't you just come from a journey? Why haven't you gone to your home? And Uriah replied to David, the ark in Israel and Judah reside in a hut. And my lord Joab, that was the uh, general of the army, and my lord's soldiers are camping in the field. Should I go to my home and eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you are alive, I will not do this thing. So you see the integrity of Uriah. So David, is uh, he still can't get around this thing. He's getting frustrated by this point. Why in the world won't this man sleep with his wife? This is part of his punishment. Uh, David, in fact, what should have happened, David should have said, this man has integrity. I used to have integrity. He should have rebounded and went back to his integrity, but he didn't see that. He just saw this as a fly in his ointment. i got to get around this. He didn't even think, well, this guy's something else. He, you know, if uh, he had been thinking straight, he would have pinned this guy with a medal, uh, named his sins to God, and went on. But he didn't. What does he do? So David said to Uriah, he's going to try again. Uriah, stay here yet another day. Tomorrow I'll send you back. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem both that day and the following day. He couldn't get him to do it, so he kept trying and trying. So then David had a, a brilliant idea. He said, you know what I'm going to do? If I get this man drunk, he'll surely go sleep with his wife. And He's thinking too clearly now. i got to cloud up his mind, take down his inhibitions. I'm going to get this guy drunk, and then for sure he'll uh, stop thinking about his integrity. So he ate and drank with him, and David got him drunk. But in the evening, he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord. He did not go down to the home. So even and yet this man's integrity was so solid that even in a drunken state, he follows his integrity. His inhibitions, while they had been lowered, it didn't matter to him. He's not going to go sleep with his wife while the other soldiers are out fighting a war. He had integrity, great integrity. So even in a, you know that's the principle. If you got a lot of integrity and get drunk, uh, you know uh, you might not have that one night stand like others who get drunk and their inhibitions are down so they go out get drunk at a bar and go have a one night stand but if you have integrity even when you're drunk you can resist such things and um, now getting drunk is not part of integrity of course it's a sin you shouldn't get drunk uh, but the fact is if you have a lot of integrity even in a drunken state you can think with that integrity and this happened with Uriah and 
Uh, David thought by getting him drunk, Uriah would uh, just go on sleep with his wife, but he didn't. And so that's a principle in itself. So then David's at his last straw. He, he doesn't, he's, he's finally, there's nothing else he can do in his mind, so uh, suddenly he starts thinking in terms of murder. You know, David's starting to sound like a member of a, a mob. Uh, what do you call him, the kingpin? He sounds like he's the kingpin of the mafia now. And uh, this is how he's acting. Now, this is a man after God's own heart. This is a man who uh, went to spiritual maturity. So if he can fail in this way, rest assured all of us can fail in uh, these manners. But uh, David recovers barely. Right before he's about to die, he recovers. <coughs> Excuse me. 11.14, in the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by Uriah. This is another instance of uh, David understands Uriah has integrity. He actually writes a letter to Joab saying, uh, kill Uriah, do it, do it secretly, and uh, murder Uriah. And he hands the letter to Uriah, and Uriah takes it to Joab. And he knew that Uriah would do this, because Uriah follows protocol and is under authority orientation. He didn't even peek at the letter if he would have. Uh, he would have seen that David is plotting his own murder. So in the letter, he wrote the following. Station Uriah opposite the heat of the battle and retreat from him. Let him be struck down and die. In other words, uh, David is so self-absorbed, he's going to have this man murdered. And that's something else to note, that a spiritually mature believer is about to commit murder after he has committed adultery. So there's irony in this. Uriah had enough integrity to take the letter to Joab without reading it or losing it. He's following authority. And uh, the irony is that that's his own letter of death. So as Joab kept watch on the city, he positioned Uriah. Now this is uh, Joab. Joab shouldn't have done this. Yes, he was under the authority of the king. But there's a higher authority. There's God's authority. And uh, Joab was a believer and he should have known better and said, David, I'm not going to do this. Uh, you can do whatever you wish to me, but I'm not going to kill a man under my command. It's putting too many people in danger. You see, by uh, letting uh, this uh, Uriah go out in the front and pulling back, he's not only uh, responsible, he not, he not only has the blood of Uriah on his hands, but all those soldiers who died as a result of that. So actually, David committed murder. He actually killed more than one person in, in, in murder because as a result of that decision, Many people died, not just Uriah. 11.17, when the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, some of David's soldiers fell in the battle. And so you see there, some of David's soldiers fell in the battle. And uh, Uriah the Hittite also died. So Uriah died along with other soldiers. And that's because of David's uh, uh, murder. 11.18, then Joab sent a full batter of battle report to David. He instructed the messenger as follows. When you finish giving the battle report to the king, if the king should become angry and ask you, why did you go so close to the city to fight? Didn't you realize that they would shoot from over the wall? Who struck Abimelech in the son of uh, Jeru Besheth? Was it not the woman who threw down on him an upper millstone from the wall and he died in Thebes? In other words, he's saying if David comes back with history and says, that's the stupidest battle move I've ever heard of, why did you do this? Um, Joab knows the state David is in, so David says, uh, tell Joab, don't let this, where are we now, 1123, uh, the messenger said to David, then uh, men prevailed over us and they came... So the messenger departed. Where are we? 1121? Who struck? 1117. 1121. Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jeru Besheth? Was it not a woman who threw down the upper millstone? Of course, I read that. And then uh, Uriah died, and I gave you that uh, he has historical uh, understanding of the battlefield. 1122, so the messenger departed. When he arrived, he informed David of all the news that Joab had sent with him. And the messenger said to David, The men prevailed over us, and they came at us in the field. But we forced them to tr retreat all the way to the door of the city gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from over the wall, and some of the king's soldiers died. Uriah the Hittite also died. So we see even the courage of Uriah the Hittite. They had chased these men 
and uh, you see the battle the uh, the main force fell back and these men kept going forward and that shows their uh, battlefield courage and even though the uh, threat of death was straight ahead they didn't care they had a job to do and they made it all the way to the gate just a handful of men and then of course they were killed so uh, David murdered a very honorable person David murdered a man of courage a very courageous military man that's that's a sad thing but David is a man after God's own heart it's an it's an interesting thing right here David looks like a creep he's acting like a creep all of us have that potential under the sin nature then said the messenger tell Joab don't let this seem uh, too bad to you there is no way to anticipate whom the sword will devour press the battle to the city and overturn it encourage him with these words 1126 when the wife of Uriah heard that her husband Uriah was dead she grieved over her husband of course, uh, she remembered the wonderful time she had with her husband, even though uh, she committed adultery. But here's the king uh, asking for her. And uh, there's indications that, in fact, it started out as a rape, and then uh, later she enjoyed it and went back. So um, it is her fault that this she did commit adultery, too. But uh, she was grieving over her husband because she loved her husband, her husband was a man of integrity, and she loved him even though she had committed adultery. But when her time of mourning passed, uh, see, David's still thinking about himself. This woman, uh, he just murdered her husband, and as soon as she stops mourning, he says, well, bring her to me. She's mine. So he's, he, he, <laughs> it's amazing how he's acting. But when the time of her mourning passed, David sent and brought her to his residence. She became a wife for him, and she bore him a son. But what David had done was evil in the Lord's sight. So, in fact, David had been sinning so much, he started to get involved in evil under the concept of self-absorption, completely and totally uh, caught up with himself, and not even uh, caring that he had uh, murdered uh, not just one person, but several people. 12.1, Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, Now this is how uh, David's conscience is going to be struck. He said, there were two men in a certain city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except for a little ewe lamb that he had acquired. He raised it, and it grew up alongside him and his sons. It used to eat from his morsels of bread, and he used to drink, she used to drink, or it, the ewe lamb, used to drink from his own cup, and it used to lie on his bosom, and it was just like a daughter to him. Now Nathan is describing the wonderful relationship uh, Uriah and Bathsheba had as a uh, marriage. And uh, I like the description, and it used to lie on his bosom. In other words, on, on the, the, his wife would lie on his chest. It's a very beautiful picture of love between Uriah and Bathsheba. And then Nathan continues, But when a traveler came to the rich man, he avoided taking from his own flock and from his own herd so as to provide for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb of the poor man and provided it for the man who had come to him. Now Nathan has just described everything David had done, uh, yet David's not thinking in those terms. So what does David do? Then David became very angry at this man and he said to Nathan as the Lord lives the man doing this will die furthermore he will pay for the lamb fourfold for doing this thing and for not having compassion uh, what David just did was issue his own sentence pay fourfold now David's not going to die and Nathan tells him this that's by the grace of God in fact that David was very close to dying the sin face to face with death but Instead, he will pay fourfold. And so when David, in his anger, says, This man will pay fourfold, he's talking about himself. He's about to pay fourfold. That means four increments of divine discipline. David's about to get back in fellowship. And when you're in fellowship, God does not give you more than you can handle. And now when you're out of fellowship, uh, you might say, Out of fellowship, God won't give me more than I can handle. If you're out of fellowship, yes, he will. He will punish you until you come to the point of rebound. And then when you rebound, that punishment might be eradicated. Or it might come in installments like for David. He was punished fourfold. And there would be, over time, year, almost his whole life, 
the punishment didn't stop until he was old. His whole life from this incident, he suffered and suffered and suffered. But it was suffering for blessing because he got back in fellowship and uh, God did not give him more than he can handle. But he definitely wasn't comfortable about all this. So you do pay for it. You don't get away with anything. David unwittingly has cited his own punishment. Even though David will not die for what he has done, he will pay for it fourfold. 12.7 Then Nathan said to David, you are the man. In other words, you're the one. Now, this is shocking. You don't talk to the king this way. You don't insult the king and call him a thief. And a, well, he was. Nathan the prophet says this. But this is a kind of brave on Nathan's part to go up to a king without absolute power and say, You are the man. Now, if uh, David were like King Saul, he would just chop off Nathan's head. That's the way King Saul acted. He said, don't insult me, I'm the king, chop off his head. And in fact, Saul did uh, chop off lots of people's head in his arrogance. Uh, but David has finally struck in his uh, conscience. And so let's see what Nathan tells him. You are the man. So says the Lord God of Israel. I anointed you as king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave to you the house of your Lord, your big castle, in other words, along with the wives of your Lord for your bosom. I also gave to you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that somehow seems insignificant, this is God using sarcasm with David. If, house, if somehow this seemed insignificant, I would have given you even much more as well. In other words, David, I've blessed you as a great king that you are, and I've given you blessing after blessing. Was that not enough? You got bored and had to do this stupid thing, and after I gave you all of this, I would have given you more. In other words, if he had continued in his spiritual life, David would have been greater in terms of his material wealth, in terms of what all was given to him. If David hadn't done this, he would have been given much more. But instead, David chose to be an idiot. And we all do that at times. Why have you treated with contempt the word of the Lord by doing evil in my sight? You have slain Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you have taken his wife to be your wife. You have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. So now the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me by taking the, the wife of Uriah the Hittite as your wife. So says the Lord, I am about to raise up over you evil from your own house. There's Absalom, and of course, uh, his fir David's first son with Bathsheba dies. And that's a whole story in itself. And so the punishment is about to begin. And uh, right before your eyes, I will take your wives. Now God is describing punishment that's going to occur over years. Years, years, many, many years later. Maybe uh, 20, 20 perhaps. Twenty years later, uh, he took his wives, Absalom did, and probably more than twenty years after that. So you can see how long the four installments of punishment lasted for his murder I will, and his adultery. I will take your wives. In other words, you took a wife. I'm going to take your wives and hand them over to your friend. And that would be his son. He doesn't know this yet, but it's going to be. He will lie with your wives. In other words, he's going to have his son Absalom actually sleep uh, with David's wives, his father's wives, and that would be Absalom's way of saying, I'm king now. That's the way they did it back then. Although you have acted in secret, you see David's trying to hide everything he's been doing, I will perform this thing before all of Israel in broad daylight. In other words, his own son is going to end up taking his wives, having sex with his wives, in the middle of the day. While David hid it, God is going to, well, God's not going to do this thing, but this is going to happen, and that's going to be part of his punishment. So a point we need to understand is that the Lord punishes his children. The Lord punishes us. Now, that's a, that's a good thing, not a bad thing. If we weren't punished, the, the Bible says if, you're, if you uh, sin and you go unpunished, then you must be a bastard. In other words, you're an unbeliever. That's what it's saying. So, the Lord punishes his children. Finally, David is shocked. He's shocked by what he's just heard, and he immediately, immediately names his sins. And uh, by exclaiming he has sinned against the Lord, David has finally acknowledged the fact that he has sinned. The first time in over a year, actually, that David uh, speaks up and says, uh, Father, I have uh, sinned. I have done thus and so. Now, what did David not do? 
He didn't fall before Nathan and weep and wallow in guilt and say, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm a horrible, oh, that's disgusting. Now, he was he regretted what he had done. He had been shocked back to reality, and he should have regretted what he'd done. And it even says in the Scripture he felt sorry for what he had done. But feeling sorry for it does not result in forgiveness. It's what David did in naming his sins that gave him forgiveness. Nathan replied to David. You see, David immediately uh, named his sins. Yes, the Lord has forgiven your sin. Do you see how fast that was? Immediately. And then uh, Nathan says, Nathan recognizes that David has just rebound, and Nathan replies to David, Yes, but the Lord has forgiven your sin. Just like that. It's forgiven. Murder. He murdered uh, more than one person. Adultery. Forgiven. Just like that. That's grace. I hope you can understand the significance of that. That's grace, and it's a wonderful thing. It means we can live a life of great peace without having to wallow in guilt about every stupid thing we do. Yes, but the Lord has forgiven your sin. You are not going to die. In other words, David, uh, you rebounded, you're forgiven, you're not dying with sin face to face with death. That's grace. Now, there's a false rebound, and it's out today, and uh, most churches teach it. There's a false rebound. Point one. Public acknowledgement of sin does not mean forgiveness of sin. And it's 12 o'clock, so I believe we'll uh, start on this. Well, actually, this uh, continues on these tapes up here. So before I close, I want to let you know that these messages continue. So next Sunday, I'm not going to be teaching on uh, Psalms 51.3 because it's already on tape. So next time it's going to be something, it's going to be lesson, this is lesson 5 and 6. Next time it will be uh, 11 and 12 next week. And if you want to keep up to date, just listen to those tapes because uh, the Word of God is important and we need to have it in our souls every day. So there's four tapes on there for you to listen to, a little pamphlet to read, and uh, that should keep you busy for the next week. And then I'll be back next Sunday. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the opportunity today to study your word. May these things enlighten us to your grace. May we note your grace and the fact that David, his sins are recorded to us so that we can see that a man after God's own heart himself committed terrible sins and yet you immediately forgave him upon his acknowledging those sins. In the same way we know, Father, that we are forgiven. And thank us, thank uh, you for letting us understand this grace. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.